judging from the number of questions that we have, I can tell that it's been a really engaging topic. So I'm just gonna jump in straight away with a question um, posed by Doug, which is, how does one get started as an expert witness? Um, there's probably two routes really to it. Um, one is to sort of establish yourself as a sort of leading expert in an area. And the other is to join a company that sells expert witness services and sort of learn your trade there. I neither are particularly easy. And I guess there's an element of sort of chicken and egg in that the legal team doesn't know if you're suitable as an expert witness until you've acted as an expert witness. <clears throat> but it's really a matter of you need to have sort of demonstrate that you've got a good insight into what goes on in your area, why it happened, what the guidance is, what the legislation is, where it's come from. And what you're after really is someone who's got perhaps an in-depth knowledge of the whys and wherefores as well as the how it's done mm. so that you can look behind the sort of legislation and guidance and what people have done and provide opinion and interpret it. Okay, lovely. The next one is what are the time commitments of an expert witness? Um, it varies depending on the particular requirement. Some of them, it might just be a couple of days to provide a report. Others, it's many months of work. I, one I did last year, we ended up spending a month in Crown Court. And before that, there'd been quite a lot of effort in going through the evidence, producing reports and dealing with oh, okay. reports, having joint expert meetings. So you can end up with potentially a couple of months or more work on a particular case. Okay, our next one um, from Janice is, have you ever refused to be an expert witness, Mike? Yes. Um, there tends to be a few reasons for turning things down. Um, one, if somebody's approached you and it's not really your area, then that's one of the good reasons for turning it down. And that sort of goes back to that Crown Prosecution Service definition. You need to be able to provide evidence or opinion in an area that you've got experience in. What I normally do is if I turn something down on the basis of it's not my area typically I'll know someone who probably is the right person so I'll pass the solicitor a name of somebody that I know deals with that area the other reason is if there's a conflict of interest if I don't know one of the parties quite well or what happened to me a while back was I was approached by personal injury lawyers for a case and they didn't know that I'd already been involved in the criminal case so I couldn't take it on because I already knew much more than an expert coming to it cold would have and I would have known things that would have mean there was a sort of perceived conflict of interest there and the other third reason is if I'm already tied up, because quite often, if something is on its way to court, the solicitor will check your availability. And I've had ones where I'm already due in court, and then a new case is due in court at the same time, sort of 200 miles away. And so, again, you've got no choice but to turn it down because you know you're not available. Yes, and um, that kind of ties into another person's question, which is how much time is spent sitting down waiting in court? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Um, there's, I mean, the, the court 
day is relatively short in that it's typically 9.30 till about four-ish. And they'll have a break mid-morning, a lunch break mid-afternoon. And I remember a judge saying to a jury on one occasion, that it might sound like a short day to you, but once you get it, you'll realize how intense it is, the level of concentration that goes on. So, but what you tend to have at court is the, it, you know, there will, because of the number of breaks, there's a lot, of, it feels like there's a lot of downtime, but it's actually quite necessary because it would be very difficult to sit there and concentrate fully from half nine till four or half four without the breaks. And it also gives you the opportunity then to discuss in the breaks, the evidence that's come up and in the, more, in the previous hour or two, and the barrister might want to ask questions about what the evidence meant or sort of interpret it, what its implications are. So it feels like there's a lot of downtime, but it's, a lot of it is actually necessary downtime. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a lot of questions coming in. So I, I feel that this might, this, this could go on forever. Um, good, yeah, which, is very, which is very, very good. Let's see how many we can get through. Um, so Phil Hadley asks, is the expert witness role free to talk on any matter or just what has, what has been asked of them? Can they speak freely to uncover items the legal professionals have not? Yes, I think what happens is you will get a series of questions I explained with the instructions and quite often in some instructions there will just be a catch-all at the end sort of, and any other issues you think are relevant mm -hmm. and what I, I, I would typically bring up any issues I think are relevant because it might just be that the legal team isn't aware of them at that point or hasn't been, perhaps isn't aware of their significance. So I would bring them up so at least people, it's, it's best that people know about them and then the legal team can take a decision on what advice they would want to give their clients. Mm. Um, Eddie Peter asks, where do you find RAMs fail when it comes to court cases? Um, typically, perhaps not giving enough detail. And I think there's almost an element of differences in expectations. I think there's almost a feeling on some occasions it ought, everything ought to be set down in minute detail. Whereas what, would, what often happens in site instances was that type of supervisor would actually brief it out to a range of staff, many of whom won't have English as their first language, mm. and so we'll need a simple brief. But the trouble is when it gets into courts, all that people have got is the sort of two, three, four, five sheets of paper with what's said on that. Mm. And they don't know what was briefed out at the same time. And if things were missed off or gaps were left, then that gets focused on. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Andrew Rippington wants to know, um, can the client change the expert witness if they don't agree with the view of the current expert witness? Yeah, I think if, I mean, I, I've not had that happen, but there, the client can decide whether they want to use that experts evidence or not mm. they might just decide not to use that experts mm. evidence I think I remember reading about a case in civil courts a few years ago where it caused problems when the team did change experts halfway through and then there's a conflict between which ev experts evidence actually stand but yeah. it, it's not something I've really come across but I think it would probably be more of a case of 
decide not to use one expert's evidence if it was going to happen and then yeah. whether they would use another one or not it would be up to them but I think most of my experience is on the criminal regulatory side I'm mm. Okay. Um, you mentioned in your talk uh, the, Raybar, the rebar case. So um, Andrew Large wants to know, why did the rebar temporary collapse client receive the highest fine? Where did failure of duty occur? That's if you are allowed to, to mention it anyway. Yeah, I, elements of the size of fine will be related to the size of the organisation. And the client was a relatively large manufacturer, <clears throat> whereas the principal contractor was a relatively small principal contractor. And the size of the organization would have a very large impact on the size of the fine. And I think that's what it's, it sort of doesn't come out as sort of obvious from just the slide I put up without the sort of context of it. I mean, to me, the failure was, as I put in the slide, it was not having temporary support in order to stabilize that reinforcement cage. It needed some Z bars or some bracing or tie back because reinforcement is never gonna be perfectly vertical there's always going to be force horizontal forces that are generated anyway just because the vertical bars are slightly off vertical and then when you start dragging heavy bars on top there's going to be a lot more and so i would it some form of stability mechanisms needed to be introduced in order to keep it upright mm. and that's the sort of as I, the, the temporary works forum we've produced a guide that was released last month and that goes into a lot of the issues and it's free to download off the twf website and a more a much more detailed guide that to a companion sorry to accompany it will be released next year Brilliant. Um, I've got a, a question from Bridget uh, Leafly. Let me see. Oh, hi, Bridget. Pull it up quickly. Uh, oops, I think it has disappeared. Just bear with me a moment. <laughs> ah, here we go. Would the system be fairer if the expert witness was appointed by the court, and she has in brackets, with the costs paid by the loser? I think in some cases you do get what's termed a simple single joint expert. I think there would, I just imagine there would perhaps might be a lot more debate between the parties on agreeing the experts. I, I think it's one of those things that the, the way the justice system is set up there's probably not a great deal that could be done to change it, but mm. it does look perhaps odd to the outside world that you're funded by an organ, a defendant or a prosecutor, or typically they're insurers, and yet your duty is to the court. And I think a lot of it comes down to really the sort of integrity and independence of the expert witnesses. You've, <clears throat> it's quite a onerous role and it works okay because you're actually you're impartial and you know, people are aware that their duty is to the court regardless of who you might be paying your bill at the end of the day. Great, um, got a question from Andy Garden um, says, you mentioned being asked for advice on cases rather than in a court case. Is that still covered by legal privilege? Um, it, legal privilege comes in when, 
I think the term is this contemplation of litigation. So if it's highly likely that litigation is going to go ahead and your organization could be involved in litigation, then at that point, <coughs> the legal privilege can be invoked. But it's the sort of thing that you're yeah, your best bet is always having a chat with your solicitor at that point mm -hmm. in order to establish whether it whether legal privilege is going to be feasible or not i mean i think it's probably expect you know, if a fatality has occurred there's probably a high expectation that there is going to be litigation mm -hmm. if it's a smaller incident then it would probably be less likely there is, or less guarantee of litigation and prosecution. So it would need the sort of solicitor's judgment on whether legal privilege would be appropriate there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I'm mindful of the time. Uh, we need to um, start wrapping up soon. So uh, just two more questions and then um, we will end this um, webinar. So question from Mike Lowry, if a small or medium sized developer has created the RAMS, this goes back to the RAMS question, yeah. is there an issue on the CDM? Sorry, could you repeat that? I'm just yeah, yeah. Um, and Clive, um, if, if I'm not making my question clear, you can, I, you know, I'm happy to unmute you if you wanna. Uh, ask the question because I, I can see you I can easily do that so let me know um, so he says if a small or medium-sized developer has created the RAMS is this an issue on the CDM? Um, I think it's if it the issue I suppose is whether it's for them to do the work or whether it's for them to pass on to the contractor for the contractor to do the work I think if it's for them to do the work themselves, for instance, house building, then the sort of developer is the contractor as well on many occasions. Um, if it's for passing on to another contractor to do the work, then I would expect that other contractor to review it to make sure that they're happy with it. I can I'm see that not Clive is unmuted. Question or not? But yeah, I've seen Clive. Clive, go ahead. Yeah, I, it's just I do a lot of SMSTS training, and um, a lot of the guys that come on there are housing developers, and they often say that um, they produce the risk assessments and effort statements for the smaller contractors. Now, you know, I know that's not right. The problem, obviously, you're aware of in the construction industry is who is the genuine employer. You know, we have these self-employed people, we have labour-only subcontractors, contractors and principals, um, you know, who, who is ultimately re, uh, responsible? Well, I think the employer, it, 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 it's one of the difficulties with the English language because the word employer and employee tend to have umpteen different meanings. I think in health and safety law, employer and employee actually have a much broader meaning than they do in employment law. So although it might be that a lot of the workers are self-employed, they're actually taking instructions from a contractor. The contractor is effectively controlling what they do. And under health and safety law, the contractor in that case would be seen as their employer in terms of health and safety law, even if they're not their employer in terms of perhaps employment law because they're self-employed. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. I am going to wrap up this meeting now and I apologize to everybody who's asked questions and we've not had a chance to, to have them answered. Um, we will be looking at the chat afterwards to gather them up and see if we can get back to you on that. Um, so thank you very much for your interest in this webinar. I can see in the chat as we go, we, you know, we have people saying, thank you, Mike, very informative, very good session. Um, so the feedback is wonderful. Um, thank you, everybody. It's all coming in from Paul and 
Andrew and Claire and, and, and so forth, Paul Davies. So thank you very much, everybody. So on behalf of everybody, I can say thank you, Mike, for your time. Um, thank you for the knowledge shared. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you for, to all the participants for attending the session. At the, at the peak of this, we had 154 people attend, which is a really good um, turnout. So we're very excited. Chilton Committee is always looking for you to get involved. Please visit our LinkedIn page, send us a message, join us in our social um, event. You will have fun, I guarantee you. At the end, you'll receive a short survey, an automatic survey. Please do give us your feedback. Your feedback is very helpful for us to deliver the content that you want. So please do that. And if there are no other comments, um, pressing comments, then I wish you a very good rest of your day. And I hope to see you soon. <laughs>